You can't have a positive mindset without being fed the right foods. You can have goals, targets, and dreams, but if your body and your mind isn't being nourished correctly, then any attempt at any dream or target will be futile. On today's show, our guest is Adam Phillips. Adam is the founder and the owner of Life Grip Supplements. His mission is to improve mental health and prevent disease through nutrition, meditation, and active lifestyles. Adam is an expert in adaptive nutrition, and his story is one of determination and good old entrepreneurial grind. But ultimately, it's a journey of discovery. Adam is a close personal friend of mine and a mate who certainly knows how to go all in. I'm excited he's here, and I know that you're going to learn something from his wonderful story. Please help me in welcoming Adam Phillips. Hi, Adam. Welcome to the show, mate. It's really, really great to have you here. Thanks for having me, Rob. It's good to be here. No problems, mate. I always uh, like to start off the show um, with a quick game with all of my guests, and it helps us warm up a little bit. It's a lot of fun. A um, little bit of word association. You up for that, mate? Yeah, up for it. All right, all right. It's really simple. All I need you to do is tell me the first thing that comes into your mind. And this is about you. I'm going to force you to make some decisions, right? I'm going to force you to make some choices. It's kind of fun. You ready? Yeah. You sure? Yeah, ready. Go. Yeah. All right, brother. Cardio or weights? Cardio. Cycling or running? Running. Chin-ups or push-ups? Push-ups. Late nights or early mornings? Late nights. Are you a late night? You're a late night guy? You're a night owl? Yeah, I am. Definitely. What time's a day kick off for you, mate? Does it kick off like at four o'clock like Jocko Willick or does it kick off at like <laughs> a reasonable hour like seven o'clock or is this too early for you? Eight o'clock in the morning? Uh, no, it uh, sort of depends on uh, what I've got on, on the night before and what time I finish up. If it's a pretty late night, if, if it's an early morning finish, then obviously it's going to be a later morning start. But if I can get to bed earlier in the evening, then yeah. I'm up early just before the crack of dawn. I don't sleep much, man. I'm a night owl, but I like to get up early as well. My body clock just wakes me up at five o'clock and I go to bed at yeah. one or two o'clock. Um, yeah. Sometimes it catches up with me, but uh, I'm a late night guy as well. All right, next one, skydiving or scuba diving? Skydiving. Oh, yeah, baby. That's a man after my heart. Vegan or paleo? Paleo. A business or a job? Business. The beach or the snow? Beach. All right, here's a serious one for you, man. Last one. Meditation or contemplation? Meditation. Really? Yeah. I can't seem to empty my mind, man. There's too much going on in my mind. I have to contemplate stuff. I, can't, I just can't empty my mind and meditate or focus. All right, nice one, mate. Well, people come to, over to this podcast to learn uh, more about others who have gone all in. So if you could please, brother, share with us your biggest all-in story or stories and the lessons that you've learned from those decisions and your commitment to success. Yeah, yeah, for sure. The biggest um, all-in moment for me was the time when I decided to face my fear of heights because, because after, after going on a bit of a self, a self-development journey, I ended up sort of working out that uh, to get uh, from where I was to where I wanted to be, uh, there was a few things standing in my road and, uh, uh, there was a few fears there and I had to uh, face an easier one to get up to uh, the most scariest fear that I had there, which was uh, public speaking. So um, I've always had a fear of heights and I decided to basically jump in the deep end. A lot of people will face fears in different ways. Uh, they'll ease themselves into it, but um, that, was, that was sort of the ultimate for me. So uh, to face my fear of heights, I decided uh, to book me you know, skydiving course, uh, which is a 10 jump course. And once I was there, like even, even when I was booking the course online, like I can remember my palms sweating, just typing in the email and booking the course and that sort of thing. And that's, that's what sort of fear does to you. Even, even though you're not even in the situation yet, even the night before, you know, you're absolutely crapping yourself. So, once I actually got into the course, it was a uh, 10 jump course and then um, jump one uh, was a tandem jump. So you're attached to someone else. That's, that's not too bad, but still very scary for someone that has a fear of heights. Uh, jump two, three and four, uh, you basically had another couple of people there with you. And then on jump five, you would only have one person attached to you on the side. 
um, and then in sort of mid free fall, as soon as they think you're stable, they'll let you go, and then you're free falling by yourself. So then, then things started to get pretty real there. But then on the jump six, that was actually the first solo jump of mine. So there would be someone jumping out with you, but they're not attached to you. So they're hanging out the side of the plane, and you're going to jump out. And I remember the morning that that we were driving down there, I was just my socks were just soaked in my shoes because I was I was just sweating that much. <laughs> And then, I mean, I remember the night before thinking that no matter what, I would just be jumping out of that plane because um, not only did I have a fear of heights, but my biggest fear was not being able to get stable in, in the air, in free fall, uh, which is a lot of people's fear for Scott, I guess. And then, anyway, uh, we went up that morning. It was the first jump of the day, early morning, and then um, I've just... I've, I've never been so scared in my life. And what was it? This, what was it that you were scared of, mate? What, what, what was? What did it feel like? And what, what were you actually scared of? Do you know what it is? Can you identify it? Yeah, for sure. Like the actual fear was the fear of dying, <laughs> because <laughs> I knew if I didn't get stable, there's a very, very low chance of the instructor um, tracking over to you, which is what they call. Now, mm-hmm. sort of flying over to you to uh, to help you out. There's a very very low chance of that, you know, because if you become unstable, you can. Um, it's very easy to get a few hundred meters away from uh, from the instructor. You know what I mean? When and, you when uh, you decided to uh, go all in on overcoming your fear of heights, did you feel mm-hmm. like at that point in the first jump, the first time you got in the plane, did you feel like you were out of your depth? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I was. I was like. It, this was just, yeah, it was a feeling of fear, you know, complete overwhelm, not knowing if, if I would come out the other side on top or not. It was, yeah, it was just a, and it was a feeling I'd never felt before. I'd been scared of things before, but this, this was, this was real fear to me. Yeah. It's funny, isn't it? I, I think there's a difference between um, being scared and mm. fear. And skydiving mm. is one of those things that evokes being scared because you're actually scared mm. for your life. Being fearful of something is being wary of something, but being scared is a completely different kettle of fish altogether, I think. And my experience of skydiving is pretty extensive, as, as you know, because we're mates. And um, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. I can relate to that intimately. Um, and all of those things happening all at once in those first couple of jumps that you do that sensory overload that you have is incredible and it's quite incredible what it does to your emotions so tell me what 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 did it feel like what sort of airplane were you jumping out of the first time was it just a little Cessna or was it something where you stood up in the airplane or were you sitting down and did you roll out of the airplane what was that Mm. first tandem like where no no it was a caravan okay um uh, yes I think that could fit like 15 people in there or something like that bigger airplane yep yeah, yeah, a big airplane, but not big enough to stand up in. So you're sort of sitting down and crouching down, um, and you and you got to squat and then sort of jump out the plane uh, with your chest facing out uh, the prop. Mm-hmm. Um, and then yeah, it was just that that sort of moment there was just those few seconds before um, was it all everything everything just come together then, and um, I knew that I mean no matter what that if I didn't if I didn't jump out on that jump six then there was no way I was going to get to where I wanted to go. And that's, um, and that's the beauty of fear. If you step into it, um, sort of no matter how scary it is, then uh, when you do come out on the other side, um, you know, your whole world opens up to you. Obstacles are funny things, aren't they? Uh, yeah. Obstacles are something that are put in front of you as barriers. You can go around them, over them, under them. Sounds like you just, what you did is you confronted that head on and you tried to smash all the way through it. Mm. Yeah, that's it. Exactly. <laughs> did it work in hindsight? Was that a good idea? It definitely did work. Wasn't there easier things to start off with than confronting the worst fear of dying and jumping out of an airplane? Yeah, look, there, there's probably other ways to do it. Um, <laughs> and everyone's got to try and find their own way, of sort of feeling their way into, into doing something like that. Um, but that sort of worked for me. I knew that, well, um, you know, I can dance around the subject for a while and try try different things, or I can just hit it head on and um, and uh, go for it. And then um, a few seconds in 
to uh, the free fall, everything started to, yeah, it's like that sensory overload. You just, you just now, you, you've just got this sense of calm that comes over you. It, it's really weird because how can you go from one second being completely fearful for your life and then a few seconds later, once you're stable in free fall, to be calm and enjoying it? Like that's, that's, I mean, yeah, complete to extremes of the spectrum, you know? It, yeah, amazing. Aren't they what my, my experience of um, learning how to skydive is slightly different to yours in the military. I learned how to do static line jumps first where you uh, you're attached to the airplane, you jump out of the plane and uh, you get a big line uh, or, you know, a static line that's goes that pulls your parachute out as you fall out of the plane. Uh, but yeah. later in my career, I was lucky enough to be on military free fall courses in the airplanes that I jumped out of. Um, you could stand up in like a C-130 Hercules. And my very first jump that I did was a tandem jump as well. And it was with a fella. Um, he was a master chief in the US Marines. So I think that's what his rank was. I can't remember exactly. Um, but he was an American guy and he was on exchange over here in Australia. And he was only a little fella. Um, I'm not really that big. I'm just shy of six feet tall. And he would have been probably five foot four. And he would have been half my size. And... Um, I can remember him, I was standing in, sitting in the aeroplane with my harness on, you know, no parachute or anything. And he's like, come on over, come and sit on my lap. And I remember everybody like kind of laughing at me. This little fellow is going to take this big guy jumping. And uh, I was sort of like, well, how do we get to the end of the plane? He goes, well, you've got to squat down and you've got to kind of shuffle to the end of the aeroplane with me. And we get right to the very end of the ramp. And I remember him tucking me in, making me cross my arms across my chest, put his hand on my forehead and said, okay, ready, set, go. And we just like kind of, we fell out of the aeroplane. We didn't really jump out. We just kind of rolled forward. And I remember not being particularly scared. I remember being a little bit more embarrassed with my mates looking at me, laughing at me with this little American yeah. guy taking this big Aussie guy out there. <laughs> but it was by the time I got to the end of the ramp and my toes were on the end of the ramp, I was looking out as well, um, fearful for my life. And that sensory overload was just incredible. And as you say, you know, a couple of seconds later, that's all gone. And you're like, man, this is the, the absolute coolest thing in the world. Um, mm. And it's a funny thing um, how when you get on the ground and you go back to the airplane, pack a parachute, go back to the plane and go and do it all again, all of those same fears come up again, don't they? Mm -hmm. it, yeah. Did, did that exactly. happened to you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I found when I got off a learning curve of learning how to skydive, I, I developed a huge respect for it. And that respect was mostly related to me um, not wanting to make a mistake. Um, but I can still remember sitting in an airplane, climbing up to height. And in military aircraft, it doesn't take you long to get up to height as it does in a, in a little bug smasher. Um, yeah. But, you know, you sort of got 10, 15 minutes to get there. You, up you go. And I can remember sitting in the plane, always going through my drills in my head and making sure I was going to get it right and feeling that anxiety and that same trepidation. And I know when I left the military and no longer did military skydiving, there's a few things in your life that you come across that help you um, use that fear. I felt like that many times and it's got nothing to do with put the parachute on my back or jumping out of an airplane. Has that happened for you in business? Oh, for sure. Yeah. What you've learned there, it, um, it definitely, it sort of links up into other areas of your life for sure. And were yeah. you all in when you learned how to do it? Did you leave yourself a little out and go, well, if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out. Or did you just go, no matter what, man, I'm committing to this. I'm going to get all the way through it. <laughs> Uh, it's funny you say that. I have I have done that a lot of times with other things, but but with that 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 was one hundred percent all in. Yeah, for sure. We, because, was there some point along the line there where you're like, "This is crazy. W what am I thinking?" Oh, that was every single day. I was I was there for the course. Yeah. And how come you that, didn't stop what you're doing? How did, what did you do to keep pushing forward? Uh, just knowing the fact that if I that if I couldn't get through this then there would be all these other things in my life that I'd be steering away from. And all that would do is just create a habit. And, and I knew to get from where I, where I was to where I wanted to be. Um, yeah, you just, you just can't do that. Even, even though skydiving is completely different uh, to what I do today, yep. people think it's got nothing to do with it, but it's what you learn from it, what you overcome. And yeah, if you step into those fears, and uh, you come out on the other side, everything, everything else opens up for you. And, and uh, the great thing about fear is by default, um, uh, once you step in and you get on the other side, is that 
and like your self worth is increased, your self confidence is increased, by default straight away. Um, yeah, absolutely. absolutely. It all starts with the decision, doesn't it? It's really interesting. You you talk about gaps, and the gap of where you are to where you want to be, that's where you, your growth really happens, isn't it? I've heard you say that a couple of times. How do you identify in your life where those gaps are, where those growth gaps are? How do you self-reflection and introspection when you look inside of yourself is a difficult thing to do. So how have you kind of managed to do that for yourself in your life? Yeah, so uh, to get from where I am to where I want to be at any, at any stage in my life, um, Usually the things that uh, that pop up, if you can imagine them, an imaginary 3D line and in between that line you've got uh, you've got all these barriers that are sticking up there, these walls. Um, they can be other people's opinions. They could be fear of failure. Um, uh, they could be your other fears of just um, um, of if you do fail, like what are, what are other people going to think about you um, and anything else that pops up and and those little barriers are the ones you've got to end up, I mean, you know, pushing over. And as soon as you push one over, um, you build a little bit more strength. And uh, when you get to the next barrier, you know, hopefully you can push it down a bit quicker. Um, and then hopefully you uh, you're not creating a domino effect, and eventually you get to where you want to be. But that there, by busting down those barriers, that's exactly where the growth is. That's that's exactly where it happens. And and um, a lot of people might be thinking, oh, look, it just hasn't happened yet. You know, I keep having these barriers come up and, and they just want to be, be at the end, you know, their end in mind, their end target. But um, in, the, in the gap is where the growth is. And, and in regards to business, that's actually where you make um, your business work is right there. It's not, it's not down the end of the road when you close your final deal or, or the best deal you've ever closed. It's actually all those foundations in between to set it up. That's what I've found so far. I know as a young guy, I used to look at successful people that drove around in hot cars because I'm a car guy. I love fast cars. I love fast yeah. motorbikes and things like that. Yeah. I always like wondered and, and thought, how, how do they afford to drive a car that's worth like three or $400,000? How do they live in those houses? How do they do that? And mm -hmm. as I got a little bit older and in business myself, I realized that it got nothing. To, that, that's the end game. Um, the, the growth that they would have went through to get there and the failures that they experienced along the way um, are enormous. And everybody has those barriers and, and challenges. I feel like failure is something that's very, very necessary in life for growth because you don't grow unless you make mistakes. And unless you go all in on stuff and have a crack at it, there's no way that you're ever going to grow and, and get there. But sometimes when we commit to a task, whether that's in business or in life or in love, sometimes that doesn't work out as well. And sometimes that can be more painful as well. Um, it's very disappointing. How have, you, how have you handled the disappointment of failures in your life? Just knowing and picking it to bits and finding out what are the positives that I just learned from that because there has to be some sort of gem in there. There has to be some gold in what, in what just happened. Um, so, like, the failure is only a failure if you don't learn from it, you know. So if you learn from that, what we, what we uh, call a failure in the eyes of society, um, that if you do end up learning from it, then it's not a failure because... You know, at the end of the day, you probably had to go through that to get to where you wanted to be anyway. You know, I often say to myself that um, you're never quitting and, and well, you never, you never fail until you quit. Um, so the failures that you yeah. experience along the road in your journey are, are obstacles that you face. And just depending on how strong your willpower is and your determination to get over it, around it, burrow under it or smash through it like you did with that skydiving and confronting that fear depends on how successful that you are in your life. Um, does, does that something that resonates with you? Like how many times, you know, sometimes we, we kind of fall over, we fall flat on our face and we pick ourselves up and we dust ourselves off and you go again, you fall over again and it's a, the same things keep happening over and over. Um, have you learned some pretty hard lessons in there? Yeah, for sure. Like it, I'm like, you can, if you, if you end up quitting, just make it sure. Just make sure it's for the shortest possible time. <laughs> you know, I, like I you're only quitting for half a day. You're only quitting for an hour, and eventually, it. as this happens more and more, you end up quitting. Like that time you quit becomes shorter and shorter, and and then um, uh, sooner sooner down the track, uh, something ends up happening, and 
and you don't end up doing that anymore. You just, ah, oh, it's an obstacle and you just get through it. You know? Going all in on stuff is a funny thing. You know, you make a thousand decisions a day and most of them are subconscious. And when you decide consciously to go all in on something and commit to it on the front end, when those obstacles happen and those failures happen, I always kind of come back to that initial decision. And sometimes I get frustrated and throw my toys like everybody and what's it all for? And you're quite right. You described me so succinctly then when you said, it only, only lasts for half a day, Rob, you know, it only lasts for half yeah. an hour. And then I, I get cranky with it. I put it aside and then I kind of half an hour later, my that emotion's gone away. And then I, I realized that I committed to going all in on to it and I just keep moving forward. That obstacle's um, and now out of the way, it might even still be there, but I just sidestepped it, went around it, and I'm going for the next one. I just kind of leave it in my rearview mirror and, and, and move forward. Mm. Would you agree with that? Is that something that's happened to you as well? 100%. Exactly. Emotions are funny things, aren't they? How they get in the way of you. It is, yeah. That's yeah. right. And your subconscious is controlling most of your actions and uh, your decision making and that sort of thing anyway. Yeah. I uh, want to shift yeah. gears a little bit here. Um, as a, and. I, yeah. I know that you're really focused on your mission statement, in your, particularly in your business, and that mission statement really seems to cross over perfectly into your personal life. You really, in your, in your supplement business, you really live that well in your personal life as well. When was it that you realized that your mission statement was really important to you? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so there was a moment there where I used to work away, I used to work in the mines, fly in and fly out of Indonesia. Yeah. And... Um, during that time, uh, from a younger sort of age, I grew up uh, sort of hanging around my mates and I used to love to party a bit. And um, I mean, it's a lot of fun, right? You know, hanging around with your mates and going to parties and clubs and that sort of thing. And uh, through that, um, um, then eventually doing an apprenticeship and then um, I ended up getting a job overseas and flying it out of Indonesia. And because I was living that fly-in, fly-out lifestyle, um, now, I was working away five to eight weeks on, no days off, and then uh, you have a couple of weeks off. So when you come back home um, or you travel to another country for those two weeks, what do you do? You end up partying because that's what you've done before. That's, that's where mm -hmm. you turn to. That's where you had, had a lot of fun. So having that position, having that career, you could party even more, for example. And you get then, a pocket full of money, right? Yeah, exactly. And then... Anyway, everything sort of come together at one point, um, like the poor lifestyle that I was living. And then on site, like the nutrition wasn't very, very good. Uh, so uh, the food that was coming out of the mess was pretty, pretty sort of poor. And everything come to a point at a time when I spent about nine months there, every time I came back to work, I'd, I'd get really sick at least once. And then the last straw happened when... Um, I lost 12 kilograms in 48 hours. Right. Like my fingernails were almost black and mm -hmm. I, was in, I was in a really, really bad way. And then from that point on, I uh, started to bring back five weeks of food from Australia. We bring back, you know, frozen salmon fillets and turkey and uh, frozen berries and that sort of thing. And then, How'd you get all that through customs? Well, it was, it was pretty funny at some times. Like I, I'd have to smuggle it back into Indonesia. <laughs> <laughs> and especially when you're bringing meat products back into Indonesia, it can get yeah. uh, can get funny sometimes. You got to you got to talk your way out of situations. But I managed to do it every single time, which which was amazing. And um, from that uh, from that experience, the poor lifestyle that I was living, I was I was sort of pushed into a corner to switch over to a clean whole food diet. Mm -hmm. And from there, that's that's when things really started to change for me. Um, by default, my energy went up, my mental clarity, I was sleeping better. And, and, just, and just my general outlook on the world changed just, just from changing my diet. So me living that lifestyle up until that point and uh, grinding through the mental battles that that poor lifestyle put me in, being forced to eat a clean whole food diet was one of the best things that ever happened to me because um, that's that's when things start to change. I started to look at other areas of my life and how I could enhance them. I, was, I, mean, I started to feel better. The way I approach challenges um, changed, obviously, as we've just been talking about skydiving. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, from there, I knew that, like, that's, that's where it all starts. Like, you, it, it doesn't matter whether you're an athlete, uh, whether you're trying to build a company, whether you're a family man, a father, a wife, 
you're um, like you can't bypass clean whole food nutrition, and this is this is where it all starts, and it all and it uh, benefits anyone. It's really interesting how you live that mission statement because the mission statement for your business is very, very similar to what that's all, that encompasses everything that you just described there. Mm. Um, I've got your mission statement here is improve mental health and prevent disease through nutrition, meditation, and active lifestyles. And that's the exact guy that I know is Adam Phillips mm. um, and, and the business that you have. So it's, it's funny how... You, did you hit rock bottom before you realized that you had to kind of change something like that? Were you, or were you on that slippery slope on the way down and not quite at rock bottom before you decided to make that change for yourself? Um, in regards to um, my normal health, uh, like I got really sick on site that time. So I was, um, yeah, I'd say I was at rock bottom in regards, in regards to nutrition and health. Yeah. But um, I knew my mental health was slipping. And, um, and I knew after changing a few things that um, what sort of put me into those battles was just that poor lifestyle that I was living. Um, that's not going to be the same for everyone, but that was, that was the case for me. And, and after changing a lot of things and um, three very, very basic things is, um, yes, is uh, clean, whole food, nutrition, you know, and living an active lifestyle and meditation and, and if you can just implement those three things, no matter where you are in your life, then you can move forward and make a bit more progress to wherever you want to want to be or, or wherever you want to go. When you made that decision, when you were at rock bottom and you were crook as and you, and you recognized that, were you kind of, were you in an all in mentality? Or were you like, Oh, I've got to do something about this and I should be, or were you like, that's enough. I'm not, I'm not dealing with this anymore. I don't want to be sick anymore. I don't want to feel like this. I know I shouldn't be feeling like this. Was, was that an all-in thing for you or was it something that happened over time and incrementally? Uh, no, that was, that was actually an all-in thing because... Um, Love it, baby. Love it. Yeah, because um, while I was working away, I obviously had my financial targets that I wanted to meet mm-hmm. and I, I actually couldn't work there anymore eating, eating that food on site and living, and living that lifestyle. If I was to continue my lifestyle, then all, all that would happen is I would just continue to get sick because that's what happened. Um, yeah, the previous nine months. So if I was to choose that lifestyle, then I would have to leave, leave that job and, and I wouldn't be able to meet, meet my financial targets. So I was, I was lucky in a way that I was forced into a corner in order to change that. So I had to go all in. Mm-hmm. Um, and it ended up being the best thing ever because, like, as you said before, do you leave sort of little outs for yourself? Do you leave, leave other things on? on the table you can reach to and find some comfort in. Mm -hmm. Um, And if you do, um, yeah, your progress is going to be a lot slower. But if you just go all in, then um, yeah, here I am today and and it was the best thing I've done. Decisions are are sometimes forced upon people. Sometimes you're forced to make a choice like you were were forced there. When you're a little bit younger, um, the decisions that you make, you you probably remember because you're a little bit older now uh, Mm -hmm. and we were all young once, but the decisions that, you make at the time when you're a bit younger always seem to be a little bit amplified and they seem really big and a bit scary sometimes and committing to stuff that has an element of unknown to it often creates fear and everybody feels those sorts of things and often people are paralyzed by that fear and they make no decision at all especially if they're a little bit younger what would you say to somebody in their last year of high school that needed to make a decision about committing to something um, to their future, whether that was university, a job, or a gap year, or something like that. What would you say to a younger person about going all in and committing and making the decision? Yeah, yeah. First of all, would be that is what they're doing currently in line with where they want to go, and is what they're doing currently um, sustainable? Like, are they if they if they keep on living the way they are, are they going to get to where they want it to be? And if they do end up leaving things aside, like little things to turn to, a little little sort of comfort zones here and there. Um, it's just it's just going to slow their progress. But in order to really know what you want to do, I I really believe in in identifying your personal values because if like that's really the only way that you can be your true self wow. by identifying your personal values, knowing knowing what you're passionate about, and then you can identify where you want to go what business you want to start or what career you want to start. Um, and then you're living a life that's true to yourself. And rather than 
trying to motivate themselves um, towards that goal, that business career, um, but they're rather pulled to it because um, they're living that life in line with their personal values. Motivation is a, is get you started and the discipline keeps yeah. you going. But both of those things are fleeting. And, and I so agree with what you're saying about living by your true core values. And when you understand mm. what those core values are, everything can, in, else in your life mm. seems to come easily and it resonates nicely. Yeah. Tell me, Adam, what are you all in on at the moment? What are, what are you committing to right now? And what are, you, what are you looking for out of that commitment that you've got going on right now, mate? Hey, cool. So a couple of things is um, improving my public speaking at the moment because that, that was actually my biggest fear before. Was that the and, number uh, one? It wasn't skydiving, it was public speaking, was it? No, can you believe it? Can you right. believe that, like the story I just told you, that public speaking was even a bigger fear than uh, jump six? What are you scared yeah. of, mate? What people are thinking of you or how you look or how you sound? What, what is it that, where's the fear in that mm. public speaking? Uh, yeah, I've, I've done a lot of analysing of that and why, why fear of public speaking and, um, would actually be there. But when I was younger, I actually grew up uh, with a speech impediment. Right. So that, that sort of didn't help, help my confidence at all uh, right. from a very, very young age. Now, now I don't even really notice it or anything like that. It's not, it's not like I started. It was just that I couldn't sort of get my words out sometimes and that sort of thing. But um, I, think, I don't think that really helped with, <laughs> with uh, like the fear of public speaking. But it, it's, it's something that I've, I've just had to keep on working and working towards. And, and basically all, all it came down to... If, the fear of public speaking is really um, you're just worried about other people's opinions because like, I mean, like here we are talking together. There's only one person in front of me, which is you. Mm -hmm. And, but then the whole game changes if, if you're in front of 10,000 people. So I think a lot of people have a fear of public speaking. They probably just don't know it because mm -hmm. they haven't been put in that situation. But in order to, um, to get to where I want to be and, and do what I want to do is um, you can't really be, uh, be steered away by a fear of uh, something like that. You know, I, I like skydiving. The, the fear in skydiving is the anticipation of the jump and mm. uh, it triggers those hormones in your brain and the anticipation is satiated when you jump out of that airplane and mm. all of a sudden that anticipation is gone and you're doing your thing and you concentrate on what you're doing. And when you get on the ground, you're like, huh, Oh, that was that was cool. Let's go and <laughs> take a parachute and go and do it again. And I, I've had very similar feelings being on stage, public speaking, where the anticipation of public speaking, the anticipation of getting up on stage in front of a group of people, whether that's ten people, fifty, or one hundred and fifty people, mm -hmm. my anticipation with that is always the same. It's not the same as skydiving because it's not a fear of death, but it's a fear of making sure you remember what it is that you want to cover. And and for me, it's always about making sure I get my message across. And sometimes when you come off a stage or out of a presentation and it doesn't feel so good, it just it's because I, for me personally, I haven't felt like I've delivered my message in a way that has been meaningful enough or impactful enough to help influence other people. Um, and so I kind of, for me, I try and focus on the message and the delivery of that message to make sure it's impactful. But you're quite right. I'm not really too worried about your opinion when we're having a conversation like that. It's very, very important to me, of course, as, you, as, as my mate. Yeah. Um, but all of a sudden, when there's 10,000 people in front of me, I've never done a <laughs> crowd that big, but it's, you know, I've done hundreds of people before. Um, you, I don't know. Sometimes if I just imagine them all naked, it kind of helps me a little bit, <laughs> helps me overcome that fear. <laughs> How are you yeah. tracking towards that? What are you doing? Are you doing like a Toastmasters? Are you doing B&Is? Are you going to networking meetings to help you overcome that fear? Oh, uh, yeah, exactly. So that's, that's how I stepped into it uh, first was actually Toastmasters. Okay. And, um, and our Toastmaster is pretty cool. Um, it's, it's pretty much a free club. It doesn't cost you much to go. And uh, it's a pretty uh, supportive environment to get you started and that sort of thing. And you have to do an icebreaker speech and that's, and that's uh, speaking about yourself. And How long did that go for? Uh, that, that only went for, uh, I think it was five, five to seven minutes, I think it was. Okay. Uh, the icebreaker, which is, a, which is a long time when it's, Oh, and it's your biggest fear. And it was only in front of, say, I don't know, 15 or 20 people. You know, it's not, not much there. But um, the feeling, what was interesting about it most was that, like, after that, the buzz that I got from it was similar to the buzz that I'd get from skydiving. It was, mm -hmm. it was a very similar thing. 
Mm-hmm. And like the buzz lasted not just for that night after I'd done it, the buzz lasted for a few days. Yeah, it's a bit addictive, isn't it? Oh, it, it is. And this is, this is one of the reasons why, why I like facing fear so much is because it's a buzz that's sustainable. Mm-hmm. If you, if you go and drink a coffee and you get a buzz, well, you have to keep drinking more coffee and that buzz uh, starts to decrease over time. Whereas if you're, if you're living a lifestyle that's true to yourself, you're in a clean whole food diet, you're being active, uh, you're facing your fears where you need, need to and um, it's a sustainable buzz. It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sustainable, amazing feeling. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's got a lot to do with human connection as well yeah i know in um in broadcasting and podcasting and interviewing and doing presentations through my regular day job in my business i i get a kick out of that as well and i looked very very closely at what, what is it that i really enjoy about that and that's human connection um there's having mm-hmm. interesting conversations with interesting yeah, people whether you're trying to sell something to them or you're just having a having a convo with them like we are now that's a yeah. really great thing and it's very very um, addictive and when you do it in a public speaking forum, uh, my experience of that is very, very similar to yours. And I'm sure most people would agree that it's, you, you do get a real kick out of it. It's like, yeah, man, I, I nailed mm. that. Just yeah. wait until you have a, a, a terrible one, man, and somebody heckles you. It's all a little bit different. It's a bit embarrassing. Yeah, that's it. And, and those feelings are amplified as well. But you yeah. learn, I think you learn harder lessons because you get further down the track of your personal development as a, as a, mm. as a man as well. So that helps a yeah. lot. That's really cool. All right, so you, you mentioned that you're all in on the public speaking. You're all in on a, I understand, a Ironman triathlon as well. Is that like, how's that going for you? Uh, yeah, so I've got that uh, planned for June this year up, up in Cairns. It's a half Ironman. Mm-hmm. Uh, I like a half is, one to begin with. Yeah, uh, yeah. I've actually done one before, mm-hmm. um, but, that, but that was a few years ago. And and I haven't done one since, so I wanted to do one again and, and uh, beat me time the last time. Because uh, the first time leg? I... What's that, sorry? What's your weakest leg? Uh, the, weakest, the weakest leg would... I don't want to say all of them, but <laughs> uh, the swim. I'm not, the swim. I'm not very... Yeah, I'm not very quick on the swim. You know, mm-hmm. like uh, the 1.9 kilometre swim, it took, me, uh, it took me just over 40 minutes uh, last time, which is... Uh, which is relatively slow compared to the rest of the uh, the middle sort of part of the field, mm-hmm. but um, yeah. And uh, the bike I've improved on, uh, the run I've improved on, so I'm looking to beat my time last time. But the first time I done it was uh, purely just wanting to finish it. I didn't I didn't care about the time. I just I just wanted to complete it and just prove to myself that I could do it. And and I was actually training for that one when I was working away. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this one's a little bit different. I've been home and. Uh, being able to train a lot more so yeah well um, we look forward to uh to hearing you do some public speaking maybe we can bring you back on the podcast and you can kind of deliver your message that way as well and get a bit of practice here and can't wait to hear how you go with that triathlon obviously you're a really busy guy with um business and with family and all those sorts of things mm-hmm. like we all are do you have any uh, habits or routines that you have on a that you do on a daily basis that keep you sharp and focused and concentrating I used to be a, a four or five coffee a guy a day and I, I leaned on that as a bit of a crutch. Um, yeah. And that was really, it's a road to nowhere, of course. And I just discovered that getting up a little bit earlier in the morning at sort of four thirty, five o'clock, going out and training and getting everything done that I want to do in the front half of the day before the day starts at nine thirty, ten o'clock, uh, yeah. that really helped me sharpen my focus. Have you got something that you do like that that helps you? Uh, yeah, for sure. I've got a morning routine and um, I just go through a basic uh, four-step process where um, as soon as I wake up, I hydrate, like which, which anyone should be doing. You know, your body's been dialyzing all night. Uh, the toxins are ready to, ready to, to, uh, to be excreted. So that uh, glass of water is hydration and gets things sort of moving on. Do you hyperhydrate better. or just like just a normal glass of water? You know, that theory of hyperhydrating with a liter of mm. water. I've tried that before and I'm like, oh my God, it was like just too much <laughs> in the morning. Uh, yeah, I, have, I have, have actually done that before. If I've been sort of delaying my first meal of the day, like mm, a little fasting. bit of intermittent fasting, mm-hmm. but um, which is something I don't do every day. It's just sometimes. But yeah, I've, I find I feel better if I do do that, but um, it's usually just just a glass of water in the morning with either uh, just straight glass of water, um, 
or I have it with a squeeze of lemon, or I have it uh, with five greens of greens powder, and and uh, then following that, I'll follow it up with the breathing exercise, whether that's sort of lung stretching to uh, to maintain or increase my lung volume, uh, some diaphragmatic breathing, or or some alternate nostril breathing, and then I'll do something active, whether that's just some light stretching, some mobility work, or I'll do something active. I'll go for a ride, swim, or run, um, and then. And then what I'll do is I'll follow that up uh, with some meditation. And um, what I do is a silent meditation. That's the one I love. I, I believe you grow, grow most through that. You're not um, doing guided what, meditations with music or somebody in your ears or anything like that? No. Um, the, reason, the reason I do a silent meditation is because um, the very first time that I was being taught, taught how to do it, um, my teacher training, that um, about, about 10 minutes into the meditation, uh, when I first done it, I felt I just wanted to get up and leave, like get up out of the meditation. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking to myself, what, why do I want to get up? I'm, I'm completely safe from a safe environment. There's just other people around me meditating. My eyes are closed, I'm breathing. Mm -hmm. Everything's cool. And I felt I needed to get up and get out. And then straight away, what, what actually dawned on me was that, oh, where else am I steering away from other areas of my life? And, and once I finished the meditation, um, I began to notice a lot of these things highlighting um, like in my time off the mat, right, in the outside world that I was steering away from still. And what, what also dawned on me there is that if I, if I had calming music to get me through that point in that meditation or, or I was being guided through it, then I wouldn't have experienced that. And so that's what the silent meditation gave me. I had, I had to get through that because I was immersed in my own in my own thoughts, in my own subconscious, that um, the silent meditation allowed me to grow through that. Um, so that's, from that experience, that's why um, I feel I get the most out of silent meditation. Oh, that's yeah. fantastic. There's some good little tools in there and some great value bombs in there as well, mate. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. My experience yeah. of silent meditation is um, closing my eyes, too fidgety, can't sit still. <laughs> and the worst part is that my ears ring in the silent. <laughs> I don't know, I suffer from tinnitus or something. I don't even realize, but like, I think it's all the heavy metal music I used to listen to when I was a <laughs> well, I still listen to now. And maybe the shooting inside buildings or something when I was in the military and aeroplanes and motor <laughs> I'm just like, I'm not deaf or anything like that. It's just when it's really quiet, my ears are ringing. And so <laughs> I, I'm kind of forced in some ways to do a, a guided meditation like that. And I, I find that actually pretty good. But if yep. I wanted to meditate, and do that without something in my ears, then that's when I kind of find the contemplation works a little bit better for me. If right. I've got just one thing to focus on and just contemplate on that one thing and that really yeah. helps a lot. When you do that morning routine for yourself and you do those four or five steps you got in there, how does that set you up for success for the day? How does that get you ready? All right, you're, you're, just, you're just clear. Your mind is uncluttered. Um, and like because you've hydrated, um, and like you set yourself up to have a nice healthy meal, whether that be a smoothie or, or what you have for breakfast, you're just ready to go. Like you're, you're activated, you've increased your range of motion because you've just done something active for the day. You've set, uh, you've set that range of motion um, as the standard throughout the day, um, you know, because you've stretched, you've done your mobility work or, or whatever you've done. And you, you just, you've got, you've got that mental clarity there um, and you're wide awake, your eyes are open, you're not trying to keep them open, and you don't need a coffee. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So you can do that morning routine every day, and it's sustainable. And you're going to, yeah, you set yourself up really, really nice. Well, that's fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Adam, for sharing your story with us. Um, you're certainly a guy that goes all in on stuff and Talk about confronting your fears, your fear of dying, of falling from heights yeah. and your fear of public speaking is probably worse than the fear of dying, dying <laughs> of embarrassment maybe, but you seem yeah, to be doing all right, mate. So we really appreciate you sharing your stories. Um, where can people find more information about Life Grip supplements? Uh, yeah, so lifegrip.com.au, um, on Facebook, YouTube and Twitter and Instagram, mm -hmm. more like all over those platforms. I'm also on LinkedIn. And yeah, just uh, jump on, check it out. Uh, there's a lot of free stuff on the blog. Um, on the website, uh, you can sign up uh, for a free smoothie and nutrition program, no strings attached. 
Uh, it'll guide you through a simple five-step process um, to create a diet adapted to you and get you feeling better and better. Well, fantastic, mate. Thanks again for coming on. And we'll have to bring you back on and let's have a, uh, another conversation about nutrition. I love that adaptive nutrition, mm-hmm. the timing, the meal sizes and all of that sort of yeah. stuff. So I can't wait to hear some more about going all in on nutrition. Thanks, Adam. And we'll see you soon, mate. Bye for now. Great. Thanks for having me, Rob. Cheers.